Max Highlights, and here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Hello, and welcome to your Max Highlights. Well, we've put together the best reports of the week for you. Let's have a look at our top three. Master of staging, how photographer Martin Schuller gets amazing shots of celebrities. Natural beauty, why Sicily is considered one of Italy's most beautiful destinations. And mapping the body, why Anthony Gormley is one of the most sought after sculptors in the world. Well, it's said that many a star is actually afraid of award-winning portrait photographer Martin Schuller because he tends to bring out a side the public rarely gets to see. He's photographed many celebrities and made a name for himself with his wacky shots. His most successful series is Close Up, and now he's back with his photo book, Portraits. Iggy Pop in a bathrobe. Robert De Niro on the subway. Christoph Vods in a straight jacket. They're familiar faces, but Martin Schuller excels in revealing facets of the stars that people have never seen before. The hardest thing is coming up with the ideas, and my ideas are often hard to implement and sometimes demand a lot of the subjects. So the ideas have to be ones I imagine they will go along with, because they see themselves reflected in them. Director Quentin Tarantino with Doves of Peace. Skateboarder Tony Hawk in his kitchen. Steve Carell, the star of the U.S. version of the TV comedy series The Office, is portrayed as an office worker on the edge. Sometimes Schiller has to resort to trickery. I bought all kinds of stuff in a stationery store, whatever caught my eye. I started out putting stickers on his face or having him chew on a pencil, boring ideas. Then the press person went to the toilet and I brought out a roll of scotch tape and said, Steve, sit still. I wrapped the tape around his head. He asked, Martin, are you sure this looks good? And I said, yeah, yeah, hold still, it looks great. Fifteen years of photographs by Schiller have now gone on show at the CWC Gallery in Berlin. There are more than 60 works, including ones that show a more sensual side of the photographer. His works represent a milestone in contemporary photography, in photo art. His color palette and his compositions, there are no rigid boundaries as there were in classical portrait photography 20 or 25 years ago. He stirred it all up, broke through the restrictions of classical photographic art. With the staging and his indirect way of evoking character, he created a new kind of portraiture. Schiller first came to prominence in 2005 with his powerful series, Close Up. Major U.S. magazines commissioned portraits from him. He eliminates his subjects with neon lights, a technique that's become his trademark. With each close-up, I capture a moment in which the subject is not fully aware that he's being photographed. There's music playing. I talk to them non-stop. Sometimes they answer me. I try to get them to laugh, and all the while I take pictures, with the aim of capturing that particular moment when they stop laughing or smiling and start to look serious again. But before the face has fallen, gone back to normal, and the facade is up again, or they are smiling. Two years ago, he made a series of portraits of twins. The portraits were commissioned by National Geographic. At first, Schurler had his doubts about the project, but he soon changed his mind. When I saw the first Polaroids side by side, I was fascinated. Why does the one have wrinkles and the other doesn't? Did the one smoke? Did the other drink more or spend more time in the sun? Suddenly it was much more gripping than just two people look the same. Mm -hmm. 
The show in Berlin is a huge success. Schiller has long been famous in America. Now he's much in demand in Europe as well. Famous people are always fascinating, but the way he presents them is sensational. I loved to see his work because I have many books from so I really enjoyed a lot. You can look at his pictures many times and always see something new. They're exciting. Some celebrities are apprehensive about being photographed by Martin Schiller since he refuses to grant his subjects any say about which photos are used. Still, almost all the stars want him to take their picture. Well, let's head south now to the Italian island of Sicily. It is the largest island in the Mediterranean and it's also home to Europe's tallest and most active volcano. Mount Etna is on the east coast of the island and is one of Sicily's main tourist attractions, drawing in thousands of visitors every year. Mount Etna is the largest volcano in Europe and it is still active. Someone who's well acquainted with Etna is Ranger Luca Ferlito. Every day he drives through the ash and lava fields to help lost tourists. He'll also be first on the scene if Etna erupts. When I first got the chance to work on the volcano and feel it breathe, it nearly bowled me over. Of course, I really respect the volcano. All his life, Ferlito has been fascinated by Etna's landscape. His family comes from this part of Sicily. When I was still little, back when I was just two, my father took me there on an excursion. That image of the volcano erupting has really shaped my life. During the major eruption of 1669, streams of lava flooded into nearby Catania. Today you can still see what it was like in the basement of the city's university. We're here inside Catania's Benedictine Monastery, only today the monastery is a university. Here you see what was then the monastery's kitchen. It was built on the lava that flowed down from Etna in 1669. A lot of the monastery and its surrounding fields were destroyed then. The eruption nearly destroyed the city, but it left behind the materials for rebuilding it as well. Today, streets, houses, and even the city's emblem, an elephant, are made from lava stone. Nearby, you can even find out what Etna tastes like. In Modica, people have always made chocolate using the stone. Luigi Balieri is the last maestro of this local tradition. First you heated the chocolate, after it melted you stirred it, and then you poured it onto the stone. These days, machines have largely replaced lava stone. The local specialty is chocolate made with cocoa, sugar, vanilla, and cinnamon. It's cooked at only 45 degrees, so it has an intense flavor. The local wine is also famed for its taste. Many vineyards are located on the slopes of Etna. The Cambria family owns one of them. Mount Etna makes this region a unique, special wine-growing area. It's really what gives the whole region its character. Here the wines have a very distinct character. They're fresh because of the altitude at which they're grown. And the mineral-rich soil makes the volcanic wines very strong-tasting. Mariangela Cambria says her family has been running the Cotanera vineyard since 1970. She's part of the second generation. The winery produces wines like Narello Mascalese or Merlot. Wine is about land, passion and love. It's not just a red liquid that you pour into a glass. It's also a history of the people who believed in the properties of the region's soil. And they still do. After the sun sets on Etna, Giovanni Trimboli's day begins. 
His wine store offers Sicilian food with a twist. This food is prepared with local wines. One of the typical dishes we prepare is cauliflower marinated in red wine. We prepare it carefully, then cook it, and then serve it with another Etna red wine. Because the wine's bouquet and taste is unique, it can't be compared to any other wine on earth. For Sicilians, Etna is not just Europe's biggest volcano. The mountain shapes the lives of almost everyone here. Well, Das Wunder von Bern, or the Miracle of Bern musical, just premiered in Hamburg. Euromax went along to its opening night last week to the Stage Theatre that also just opened its doors for the first time. The story is based on a movie from 2003, and it's not just any old movie. It is one of Germany's best-selling films that looks at the powerful role sport history played in post-war Germany. The Miracle of Bern, the legendary 1954 World Cup final, is now a musical on show in Hamburg. A new theater with 1,850 seats was built specifically for the show. Located right on the Elbe River, it cost 50 million euros. Musical lovers, football fans, and even Horst Ecke, one of the 1954 world champions, attended the premiere. But the question on everyone's mind was, do football and musicals go together? Well, they go together flawlessly. You just have to have the right people. I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> I can imagine it quite well, because in soccer there's a lot of emotion, a love of sport, and that will definitely be conveyed by the actors. They love the stage. It will be sensational. Football on stage works just like it does everywhere else. But this time it's not just football. There's also singing and dancing. How do you do a musical about football? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. The musical is about the unexpected victory of the German football team against the favorites, Hungary, in 1954. But it's also the story of a family in the aftermath of World War II. The father is still traumatized from his experience as a prisoner of war. He and his family struggle to adapt. A few days before the world premiere, the final rehearsals are taking place. Close to 40 actors have spent two and a half months preparing for the production. For director Gil Meymert, the World Cup title was a key moment in German history. This unbelievable victory triggered such emotion that it was almost an act of liberation for the whole nation. Because in the preceding years, what was supposed to give the nation a sense of community was something very terrible and absolutely misdirected. Then, suddenly, there was something positive people could identify with. The miracle of Bern became a legend. In 2003, director Zonka Wurtmann brought the story to the big screen. Seen by millions, it's won a host of accolades, including the German Film Award. The musical in Hamburg draws heavily on the film. But playing football on stage is a real challenge. You can't recount a football game on stage. Zenko Wortmann's production was completely different, because he had to describe a game using the language of film. Thank goodness we don't. Perhaps in its advantage that theatre has its own language. We work with vertical acrobatics, which led us to the next problem, how to program the ropes that move the actors. It was extremely complicated, and during auditions, we had to keep in mind, we needed actors who could climb the walls. One of the actors, Mark Weigel, had until recently rehearsed for two parts, for the father of the family and Fritz Walter, the captain of the 1954 German national team. Weigel doesn't even play football in real life. Still, he had to make the key moment convincing. 
Film war das der Fallrückzieher, das ist es In the film auch. it was the bicycle kick and it is here too. In film you can just make a slow mo shot, but on the stage we can't do that because it's in real time. But we found a way to get some slow motion in by producing a time loop with this rag ball. Und das funktioniert mit diesem Lumpenball sehr sehr gut. It works very very well. The ball is made from old rags that have been tied together. It's guided by a stick. Es gibt eine Bewegung and then in one movement I hit it with a slow flying bicycle kick. And I think the scene is awesome. Ich mag diese Szene wahnsinnig gern. The Miracle of Bern is one of Germany's few homegrown musicals. Most shows are adaptations of British or American productions. In Hamburg, the audience seems to enjoy the German show. Touching, really good. It was really well done. I didn't know the film. The technical elements were really spectacular, and there were impressive scenes that really stick in your mind. The organizers hope to attract up to 650,000 spectators a year, and who knows, maybe someday the miracle of Bern might happen on Broadway. Well, Anthony Gormley is one of the major British sculptors of the 21st century and he works mainly with steel. A lot of his work focuses on the human form. He uses moulds taken from his own body, so you can literally find him dotted all over the English countryside in cathedrals, beaches and in town squares as well. Well, he's also got a sculpture in Duisburg at the moment with a piece from his Blockwork series. Seen from up close, it's a cluster of steel blocks floating in space. Only when seen from a distance does it appear as a figure. This work is titled Loss. It was created by British sculptor Anthony Gormley. It's meant to reflect the viewers and give them pause to think about their own bodies. I think in a time of the internet, in a time of globalization, in a time of mass, uh, mass movements of people and things, sculpture calls on us uh, to think about place and the primary place where each of us lives, which is the body. Duisburg's Lehmbruck Museum primarily features exhibits from the 19th and 20th centuries. Among them are works by the sculptor who gave the museum its name, Wilhelm Lehmbruck. For him, just as for Anthony Gormley, humans are the measure of all things. What's unique about his work is that, in general, he's maintained his focus on the human figure down through the decades. He's even gone against all the waves of abstraction that moved away from portrayals of people and the human body. He stayed with the human figure because he's convinced it's the very foundation of our lives. Anthony Gormley has returned to one human figure over and over again, his own. He's exhibited casts of himself in galleries all over the world, recently in Norway. Bern, Switzerland is currently hosting the expansion field, 60 steel block clusters as abstract renderings of the human body. 64-year-old Gormley creates his works in his London studio. He studied art in the 1970s and then went on to focus on sculpture. It was not about making pictures of things, it was about making things. It wasn't about making a representation of the world, but about provoking the world by putting something in it that wasn't there before. Um, and that seemed to me to be both a more exciting intellectual project, but also a more exciting physical one. Anthony Gormley tends to shun museums, preferring to display his work in the midst of the city or in nature, as here in 2010 in the Austrian Alps. And if his works do appear in a museum, he likes them to be accessible to as many people as possible, as his Horizon Field here in Hamburg's Deichtorhallen in 2012, 
Visitors could walk or do cartwheels across the floating reflective surface and become part of the installation themselves. The life that comes to occupy this opportunity is the work, not the piece itself. You could say that without people, uh, art is nothing. Uh, art is about sharing. Anthony Gormley's reputation as one of the most noted contemporary sculptors is well established. Works such as Loss are aimed not just at a contemporary audience, but at generations to come. This is a work that talks to a time that hasn't happened. Uh, we consume our own culture too quickly, and as we do that, it becomes increasingly thin. I think my duty is to make an account of what it feels like to be alive today that will always make more sense tomorrow. Just as the blocks that make up loss only come together as a human being from afar, Anthony Gormley's works may only come together in all their import with the passage of time. Well, it's Advent again and season of the Christian calendar that lasts up to a month. It's taken from the Latin word Adventus, which means the coming. So with that, there is also a lot of waiting and preparation for the celebration of the Nativity of Jesus on December 25th. One of the traditions that has become part of the countdown to Christmas are the Advent wreaths, which are quite popular in Germany, even if you aren't religious. No matter what size, shape, or style the wreath, it always has four candles, one lit on each of the four Sundays before Christmas. It's a common sight in German living rooms. An Advent wreath is essential, lighting the candles on Sunday and being together with the family. It's just a holiday custom to create a little Christmas spirit. It reminds you of your family and times past. The first week of Advent is the busiest time of the year for florist Michaela Knorn. She sells about 30 Advent wreaths a day. We have lots with storybook figures and princesses, children's motifs like Little Red Riding Hood. This year's trend is for more magical, romantic, fairy tale themes. Most people like thoroughly traditional color schemes. Red is the classic color as always, such as red ribbons. White and gold are always popular. It's the classic color schemes that people take home during this cold, dark time of year. Theologian Johann Hinrich Wichern invented the Advent wreath in 1839 in Hamburg, where he ran a house for poor and orphaned children. To help them fill the long weeks until Christmas, he created the first advent wreath on an old wagon wheel. In addition to the four big candles, it was lit by 20 small ones as well, one for each day. His invention has since spread throughout Europe and the United States. The advent calendar, too, dates back to the 19th century. It's still a big hit with children today. They open one door on each of the 24 days leading up to Christmas. The original version featured biblical sayings. The little illustrations came later on. The chocolate treats behind the little doors did not become popular until the 1950s. An estimated 70 million calendars are sold in Germany every holiday season. The advent calendar has also become an object of innovation for designers. This spice-filled edition even won an award. This 1 meter 30 tall tower is an imaginative twist on tradition. On the more complicated but fun side is the do-it-yourself option. Creating your own advent calendar is the nicest way. This year I put one together for my sister. I still want to make one for my boyfriend. <laughs> The Advent season kicks off on Sunday, and with it, the countdown to Christmas.
That's all we have time for today on Euromax. If you did miss any of our reports, you can always head to our website and have a look at the repeats there. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.